The Hollywood Reporter asked a bunch of comedians if they could bring a fellow comedian back from the dead, who would it be? Both Kevin Hart and Michael Che said Bernie Mac. Judd Apatow and Dave Bird, Little Dicky, said Chris Farley. Tiffany Haddish picked George Carlin. Ali Wong picked Patrice O'Neill. Aquafina picked Joan Rivers. Bowen Yang said... Lot from the Bible. I assume he was funny because he had a really wacky life. Phoebe Robinson said, hands down, John Candy. The man was so formative when it came to comedy for me. Of course, we have different styles, but I love his work so much. And the way he could weave in and out of comedic and dramatic moments, it's masterful. Paul W. Downs picked Lucille Ball. Michael Shore said the worst thing you could do to comedians would be to yank them out of the afterlife and insert them into another era. Most comedy becomes stale after a few years, never mind a few eras. Kristen Wiig picked Robin Williams. Bill Burr said, Ollie Joe Prater, so I could ask him if he really burned down the improv. And I was like, huh? So I did some Googling, and I found an article from Vulture about Mike Binder's documentary about the comedy store. Vulture asked Mike Binder, was that why you didn't get into the story of the improv burning down during the comedian strike way back when? Because the rumor going around was that two store comics who crossed the picket line, Ollie Joe Prater and Biff Maynard, might have torched the improv to please Mitzi Shore. Mike Binder said they didn't. I could tell you for a fact they didn't. But you're right. The problem is the strike should have been half an hour, 40 minutes. But if you knew Biff or Ollie Joe, if they'd done something like that, they'd have come back to Mitzi bragging. And if you knew anything about Mitzi, she would have turned around and called the police. Mitzi was not a gangster. So, Bill Burr, you're going to have to choose again because we have now solved that mystery. Will Ferrell told The Hollywood Reporter, people come up to him all the time and are like, oh, my gosh, it's you. Do something funny. And I don't know what I'm supposed to say. Will admits he's skilled in the art of pulling down his baseball cap just enough to obscure his identity as he walks by crowded college bars. Though he's gotten better at playing the part of Will Ferrell in public. For example, he was out golfing with his buddies. A couple young guys yelled out, hey, can we get a photo? Will Ferrell yelled back, it's a hundred bucks. They all howled. Back in 1995, when Lorne Michaels hired him on SNL, one prominent critic had called Will Ferrell the most annoying newcomer, which Will wore like a badge of honor. Will had that mounted on a nameplate and hung it on his office door. He said, you have a choice with that stuff. Read it and believe it, or just laugh at it and kind of dig in and go, oh, you hate me? You haven't even begun to hate me, and that's my competitive side. Oh, just wait. I'm going to go at it even harder. Lorne Michaels has never wavered on his pick. He says, I never rank, but Will's definitely in the top two or three that have ever done the show. Wow, there's no question. Now, personally, I met Will Ferrell once, and he was ice cold to me, which wasn't about me. It was about Jim Brewer. I didn't realize at the time that there's some bad blood in the whole Jim Brewer, Adam McKay, Will Ferrell verse. So me being naive, walked up to Will Ferrell serious one day. I was like, hey, can you come on Jim's show for a couple minutes? Will looked through me. It was like I had asked him, like, hey, I'm having a Hitler rally. Do you want to come? I mean, ice effing cold. I later figured out why. But at the moment, I don't know. I was like, what is with this dude? He just turned on me. So I have never been a Will Ferrell fan since I met Will Ferrell. Sorry to burst your bubble there, everybody. Paul Reiser shared with Forbes that he had memory the other day. I was flying to some gig, and as George Carlin used to say, we work for free. You just got to pay us to get on a plane. That's the drag part of being a comedian. Being on stage is the treat. And I remember a moment in high school flying somewhere to see a potential college. I think it was upstate New York. I remember it was a cold winter. And what made it palatable is I had this fantasy that I was on my way to some town to do a stand-up show. That was my fantasy. It wasn't winning an Oscar. It wasn't being James Bond. It was like, man, if I could be like Robert Klein or George Carlin. So 50 years later, I'm on a dull flight and I thought, oh yeah, I remember when you wished you were going to do a show? You're doing it. So it never wears thin. It's never something I take for granted, and I know a lot of my comedian friends and musician friends feel the same way, too. The fact that we skated through, I can't believe nobody's caught on to us yet, that we're actually doing what we want to do in these knucklehead jobs of ours. We're flying and telling jokes, or in their case, going and playing some songs. It's never something I take for granted. I'm a big fan of Bill Carter's podcast, Behind the Desk, and all the books he's written about late night. He was asked by the laugh button, you ever think maybe there's nothing left to uncover? Bill Carter said, yeah, I did. What really happened was the podcast was supposed to be quite modest, like maybe I'd interview Jimmy Kimmel for 40 minutes and the producer of The Daily Show, and it'd be an interview show like many podcasts are. Then CNN wanted more, and I was like, all right, and I came up with this plan to do separate themes. 
What are the elements of late night? Well, the host. So I did a show about the host and what it takes to be a host, but not just interviewing them, talking about sort of where they came from, what they have to do, how it changes their lives. And then I did one on the format because I thought something really enduring about the format. Why? Why does it work like that? Then I wanted to do writers because I think writers are amazingly unusual. I thought no one's done this. No one sat down and talked about writing for one of these shows. And they're essential. When Steve Allen started, he had four writers for an hour and 45 minutes. Now they've got like 20 people writing the shows. But it's interesting. There's people that just write monologue jokes. There's people that write sketches. And then I did a whole one about comics getting their first break, which I thought was just a unique thing. And I knew there were great stories and I wanted to do that. And then I did one about the way politics have changed. So I came up with much more of a documentary approach that required me to talk to several people that I wouldn't have talked to otherwise. Vulture asked Howie Mandel how he found his voice and his persona. Howie said, well, April 19th, 1977, to be exact, I went to a comedy club called Yuck Yucks in Toronto. It was the first time I saw stand-up comedy live. They said, at midnight on Mondays, amateurs can get up. People I was sitting with said, you should get up. And I went, all right, I have mental health issues. But I would say yes and don't think of ramifications. So I showed up thinking the joke is going to be, they go, ladies and gentlemen, Howie Mandel. And I'm going to walk out and it's going to be me like I'm not a comedian and they don't know I'm not a comedian. And that's a joke. So I was introduced and I walk out. There's a smattering of applause. The applause dies down. Nobody knows who the hell I am. I barely know who the hell I am. I'm standing there blinded by the spotlight. You can see the front row. and There's people who don't know I'm looking at the mic like, OK, funny boy, you were introduced. The realization became terror. And I realized, what the F did I just do? I started going, I got to come up with things. I'm actually legitimately, authentically panicking. I'm going, all right, all right, all right, okay, okay. And the audience started giggling at my discomfort, which I didn't understand because I was so self-conscious. So I start going, what, what? No, really, what? And I started saying things like, oh, come on, don't laugh. It's throwing me off. I suffer from OCD and have my whole life. I remember being uncomfortable putting one of my hands in my pocket and thinking, oh, crap, I've got a rubber glove that I carry just because I don't want to touch things in a public restroom. So I took the rubber glove out, needing to do something. I pull it over my head and I pull it past my nose. I'd never done that before. I start breathing and the fingers are going up and down. I can hear the audience is roaring. So I just started inflating it with my nose. It blows up and pops off my head and they go into spontaneously applause and I go, good night. <laughs> the founder of Yuck Yucks says, that was amazing. Come back tomorrow. And I go, for what? And he goes, you do it again. And I go, do what again? And he goes, do what you did. I didn't do anything. But I started coming back and showing up at that place. Joe Coy had no idea what he wanted to do with his life until he caught Eddie Murphy at the Seattle Coliseum in 1986. I was blown away, said Joe Coy. He killed it, telling jokes in front of 15,000 people. His stand-up was amazing. He was incredible on SNL. People forget he was just 20 years old when he was on SNL. He saved that show. If Eddie Murphy didn't join SNL, I think the show would have been canceled. Probably true. I loved his stand-up, but what he did on TV was so powerful. After I saw that, I knew what I had to do with my life. His mom had other ideas. She wanted me to have security. My mom wanted me to have a job with benefits. She would have been happier if I was a bank teller. But I couldn't work a job like that and be happy. But it turned out all right for me and my family. And Vulture spoke with some comedians about jokes they regret. Weird Al Yankovic said, I tend to go for what I consider family-friendly humor. A lot of the material I've done... There's nothing overtly sexual. It's the kind of music that families can listen to on car trips. Nobody gets too embarrassed. Having said that, listening to some of my old material, there's some words and terms that I've used that have dated very poorly and I would not use in the present day. But you have to realize in the time they were written, they weren't considered as much as a slur. In fact, there are some words that I use that are completely innocuous in North America, which are horrible slurs in other parts of the world, which is something I had to learn. I try my best not to offend. There's a couple songs in the 80s where I used the word midget, which in the 80s was not that much of a slur. It was not a kind word, but it wasn't a slur. These days, I do not say the word. In fact, at one point on the tour, I sang the song that had the word in it, and I stopped the whole band and just explained to the audience how language has evolved over time since I originally wrote the song. That whole diatribe about why I used the word then, wouldn't use it now, and then we resumed playing and ended the song. Language changes over time. Some comics make it their thing to never apologize for anything. And as we're seeing today, some politicians are the same. I feel like if I did something I'm sorry for, of course I'll apologize. I mean, we all make mistakes. Sometimes I did things I shouldn't have done. Sometimes you have to call yourself out on it. And that's your comedy news for today. Follow the show on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Google Podcasts, wherever you get your shows. I'll see you tomorrow.